So let's turn in our Bibles, first of all, to Romans chapter uh, 3. Now, uh, in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 25. Now, this morning we're dealing with the matter of propitiation, that uh, word in the Bible that helps us to understand about Bible salvation. Now, that's the most important doctrine, I believe, in relation to salvation is the doctrine, the Bible doctrine of propitiation. Now, uh, now last week we pointed out there in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 that Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. Now, uh, and that's a doctrinal matter. You see, that has to do with the Bible teaching about how Jesus Christ defeated Satan on the cross of Calvary. Now, in uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, now, see, the Bible says God sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, you see, that has to do with Bible doctrine and the Bible doctrine of propitiation. Now, as you turn to Romans chapter 3 and in verse 25, the Bible says, whom God set forth. And that means that it was clearly revealed what God did in this matter of propitiation. Now, there's no question about it at all. Uh, for God, uh, Romans 3.25, uh, whom God sent forth to be a propitiation, say, through faith in His blood. And propitiation in the Bible is always associated with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and um, then it goes on to say in verse 25, uh, just um, in verse 25, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. Now, see, it is only through the Bible doctrine of propitiation that God can be a righteous God and in a righteous way forgive us of our sin. And then uh, he goes on to say, say in verse 25, that are passed through the fair bear, uh, forbearance of God. Now, see what it's talking about there is, see, all the Old Testament sins were forgiven on the basis of what Jesus Christ did on the cross the, uh, when He uh, was a propitiation for our sins. Now, you see what it says in Romans 3 and verse 26, uh, to declare, I say, at this time, say, His righteousness. Now, see, this is a Bible doctrine that has to do with the righteousness of God. How God can be a righteous God and forgive sinful man of his sin. Now, uh, let's turn over the book of 1 John. Now, in the book of 1 John, and in 1 John chapter 2, and we read here in um, verse 2. Now, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's everybody get our Bibles and let's read that together. And he is... Now, uh, so he's a propitiation. You see what it says there? For our sins, not only ours, for the sins of the whole world. We can truly say that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. And then as we turn over in our Bible to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Now, you have another verse in the Bible where that word propitiation uh, is used again. And that's 1 John chapter 4 and uh, uh, verse 10. And let's read that together now. Herein Amen. Now, uh, you may be seated. And that is what uh, the Bible doctrine of propitiation is all about. How that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. In other words, He was the atoning sacrifice. He is the one that satisfied God the Father in relation to our uh, sin. It's the, the wrath-removing sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we uh, study about this doctrine in the Bible, the thing we need to be reminded about, they say this is salvation from God's standpoint. See, not from man's standpoint. 
but from God's perspective. Now, uh, from man's standpoint, we talk about the forgiveness uh, of sins, to different things along that uh, line. But now propitiation is looking at salvation from the standpoint of God. Now, as we study the Word of God, what we find is that uh, the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was the perfect Son of God. Now, uh, and you see, God is absolutely holy. Just like we read about the Lord Jesus, there are four different times the Bible is very specific that He did no sin. There's no question about that, that He never sinned. Now, as we study the Word of God, what we find is that God is a holy God. God cannot look upon sin. Now, this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. See, and uh, when uh, man sinned against God, and then the judgment of God fell, man died, sin came into the world. Now, uh, see, God is a holy God. God is absolutely uh, perfect. Now, how can an absolutely perfect God forgive somebody of their sin. And that is what the Bible doctrine of propitiation is all uh, about. See, sin is obnoxious to God. It's repugnant to God. It's an abomination in the sight of God. The Bible teaches very, very clearly that God must judge all sin. See, no one will ever be able to get away with any sin. God has to judge all uh, a sin. Now, uh, how can God save a person? How can uh, God take somebody to heaven? You see, and this is what the Bible doctrine of propitiation is all about. See, no one can ever get to heaven unless they are absolutely perfect. Only perfect people go to heaven. If someone is not perfect, they cannot go to heaven. Now, you see, the only way a person can be declared righteous or justified or perfect in the sight of God is through Jesus Christ. See, we have no righteousness of our own. But when we receive Christ as Savior, you see, He imputes to us His righteousness. You see, and that is why a person can go to heaven because we have the righteousness of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now over and over again, the Bible is very, very clear that uh, the Bible teaches the wrath of God over and over again in the Bible. We learn about the wrath of God. We uh, read about the wrath of God. Now, again, in the Old Testament, there are 585 references to the wrath of God. Somebody checked it out. They said they studied it all out, and uh, they uh, came up with the fact that there are 585 references to the wrath of God in the Old Testament. Now, uh, many people say uh, that, well, that's the Old Testament, but a lot of people would say, we do not uh, uh, learn anything about the wrath of God in the New Testament. That's the Old Testament. God was a dirty bully. God judged sin in the Old Testament. But uh, many would say that the New Testament doesn't say anything about the wrath of God. Now, it's very interesting around this time of the year, uh, that's the impression that everybody gets. See, uh, around the time, uh, this time of Christmas, most all the pageants, most all of the emphasis, most all of the preaching uh, this time of the year has to do with, the, you know, God is a jolly good fellow and peace on earth, goodwill uh, toward men, that Jesus came to bring uh, peace on the earth. Now, most of the pageants, uh, even in our fundamental Bible-believing churches, uh, could be presented uh, on television to the secular world and nobody would ever be offended. In other words, Jesus Christ came to bring peace in the, uh, into the world, and uh, that's why he was born, and uh, it's a beautiful, uh, majestic, uh, sweet story about the birth of Christ. Now, and as a result of that, see, there are many that do not believe that uh, God is a God of wrath 
in the New Testament. See, a lot of the uh, preaching around Christmas is uh, very weak Bible preaching. Now, a lot of times uh, preachers have to get up sermons about the birth of Christ, and so they get some great devotional thought um, from uh, the story in Matthew or in Luke, but a lot of times it's very weak from a biblical standpoint, and it misses out why God came into the world and what it's all about. And what it's all about is about Jesus going to the cross to die for our sins. Amen? That's why he came in uh, to the world. He didn't come to bring peace in, uh, on the earth, anything like that. Uh, it, it, Jesus said, I br I'll bring a sword and I'll divide a husband and wife and children and their parents in relation to the gospel. But now uh, the New Testament is very, very clear. We read over and over again in the New Testament about the wrath of God. See, those who deny that the New Testament teaches it, the New Testament begins in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, begins, we all know, with John the Baptist. And we all know that John the Baptist preached the message, flee from the wrath of God. In other words, see, you must repent. You must turn to the Lord, uh, turn from your sin and turn to the Lord and flee from the wrath to come, that there is judgment upon uh, a sin. But he used that word uh, wrath. In Mark 3.29, we read there about eternal damnation. And Jesus had more to say about hell than anybody else in the New Testament. And then in John 3.36, that familiar salvation chapter, the Bible says that the person who does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says in John 3.36, see, the wrath of God. Now, see, the wrath of God abideth on that uh, person. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God, God, Romans 1.18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So, say, throughout the New Testament, you read about the wrath of God. Say, God is a God who judges sin. Now, a lot of people go to church around uh, the Christmas season, and they never know that. Uh, I've known people have gone to pageants and Bible-believing churches, and... Uh, it was water off a duck's back. There's nothing there about salvation. Uh, there's nothing uh, there about the conviction uh, of sin. I heard one recently. Uh, last week, a church had a, a program, and the whole program was based on the Christmas carol, uh, Charles Dickens' book, and it's, it's a good book to read, you know, from a se secular standpoint. But the whole program was based on Scrooge. You see, Scrooge was stingy, and, and then he had to turn around in life. By the way, that Charles Dickens was a very wicked man. He, he lived in sin, and uh, he was not a nice man. By the way, the man that wrote that book, if you know anything about his life, he was a real uh, pervert. But anyway, um, you see, Scrooge turns around, and now he's buying everybody a turkey. You know, because he has uh, the, the, the nice uh, air about him after he uh, turns around. Now, and, uh, and churches, the fundamental church had that and that program. And they said, you know, you'll find uh, uh, a joy. You see, uh, you come to know Christ, things like that, and all kinds of things along that line. And, uh, and, but there's no gospel in it at all. I mean, there's no gospel. Now, you know, it's hard to preach the gospel when you're preaching about Scrooge and teaching about Scrooge. See, it's, uh, there's no gospel there uh, at all. But now, uh, you see, a lot, of, a lot of people, especially around Christmas, they, they are instructed in the attitude, Jesus is a nice guy. He's a glorified hippie. He goes around, he pats everybody on the back. Everybody's on their way uh, to heaven. There's no such thing as sin. Now, Romans 2 and verse 5, the day of wrath and the righteous judgment of God. See, the Bible over and over again in the New Testament talks about the wrath of God. Romans 3.19, all the world is guilty before God. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible, and we're just listing these because um, uh, a lot of people don't understand 
the New Testament talks about the wrath of God. Now, you see, like in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible says every person before they were saved were a child of wrath. Now, that's what Ephesians 2 and verse 3 says. See, uh, we, are, we were the children of of wrath. Now, what does that mean? Before we were saved, we were under the wrath of God, and it's just a matter of time before we'll wind up in hell if we didn't get saved. Now, um, in Ephesians 5 and verse 6, the Bible in that same book, it says, let no man deceive you. Now, in other words, a lot of people are deceived, and what is Paul talking about there? And what he's saying is that, see, God does not judge sin. And by the way, that was a major theological era in the New Testament. See, you study uh, the New Testament books, and, and that's a background of a lot of books in uh, the New Testament. See, that uh, uh, sin is nothing. You can live any way you want. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 6. 1 John talks uh, about it. You see, where uh, you get... Uh, Say you believe in Jesus, but you can live any way you want. You can do anything you want. And there's no real such thing as sin. And by the way, that's being popularized today in uh, Bible-believing circles. That, that teaching is being, uh, being resurrected in a lot of churches uh, today. You see, um, it's so sad uh, what's going on in Bible-believing Christianity. See, where uh, a lot of people now are writing and teaching about the matter that there's no such thing as personal sanctification. In other words, they say, well, you're sanctified, you're made right in the sight of God, you're justified in the sight of God. Therefore, as a Christian, you are uh, perfectly sanctified, so there is no need for any child of God to seek to live a holy life or a righteous life. Man wrote a book uh, some time ago. He was on all the television, radio programs promoting his book, became a, a bestseller. And so I thought I'd get that book. And uh, so I, I bought it and I read it. And somebody asked me about that book. And I said, well, uh, the guy who wrote that is a heretic. I said, uh, what he's saying in that book is heresy. Now, as time went on, a lot of other people finally realized that what he was teaching was heresy. Now, see, what he was teaching was that if you get saved, it doesn't matter how you live after you get saved. You can live in sin. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, you're saved and uh, that type of a thing. Now, that man today is not in, well, put it this way, he is in the ministry. He's pastoring another church. See, his church kicked him out. Why? Because uh, he committed adultery and his wife committed adultery. And so the church, now, now you see what I'm saying? See, uh, he's a man that was teaching uh, there's no such thing as sin in your life as a child of God. See, and that's heresy. And, uh, but now he's pastoring another church. And uh, uh, it's a terrible thing. In fact, uh, his wife married somebody else. He married somebody else. And it's just a, a, a matter, a, a terrible matter. Now, the point I'm making, though, is that, you see, that man taught and teaches today there's no sin in the life of a child of God. And, um, you see, that is heresy. See, uh, the Bible teaches sin. Every unsaved person is a child of wrath. They are under uh, the wrath of God. Now, in Ephesians 5, in verse 6, the Bible says, let no man deceive you. Now, he's talking here in Ephesians 5, verse 6, about the matter of sin. He said, don't let anybody tell you uh, that it's all right to sin or to have a light attitude towards sin. Now, uh, he says, um, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. In other words, say, say God's wrath will be poured out upon those who sin against God. See, over and over again, the Bible uh, teaches this very, very uh, clearly. Like in uh, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 16, it talks there about the wrath of the Lamb. Now, wait a minute. Uh, somebody said, I, I never heard about that. I heard of the love 
of the Lamb. I heard about the sacrifice of the Lamb. But in Revelation 6, 16, the Bible talks about, say, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, now, see, God's wrath is poured out and will be poured out upon sin. Now, when someone gets saved, they are saved from the wrath of God. See, when someone gets saved, they are saved from hell. That's the teaching of the Bible. Turn to Romans chapter uh, 5. Now, uh, in Romans chapter 5, and you read there in verse 9. In Romans chapter 5 and verse uh, 9, it says, Much more being now justified, say, by His blood. See, when you come to Christ, you are justified on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. But see what the Bible says here in Romans 5, 9. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. See, we are saved from wrath, the wrath of God, through Jesus Christ. See, we are saved from the wrath of God. Turn over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and in verse uh, 10, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for His Son from heaven. Say, uh, by the way, we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're not looking for the signs of the times. The Bible says we're to wait for His Son from heaven. Not signs, but His Son. By the way, I was reading a book uh, recently about the middle 1850s. And if anybody would uh, learn and study about the society in 1850, you know, uh, way back then, you would think that you were reading about the United States of America today and what is going on in America today. In other words, you've heard it said many, many times, and it's true. See, history repeats itself. I mean, all of the sins. Now, uh, would you believe that during that time there was a real issue in relation to abortion? Way back yonder there in uh, uh, the 1850s. And uh, the political situation was much like it is today. I mean, it's almost parallel to what uh, is going on today. And if you read about the society of that day, you'd think you're reading about America uh, today. It's uh, uh, amazing how parallel it is to what's going on uh, uh, today uh, in America. See, uh, there's always been sin in the world. By the way, uh, there's a great wave at that time in America, like I say, very similar to today in relation to the churches. And uh, many of the uh, most well-known preachers of that day denied original sin. They did not believe that man was born a sinner and number two, they, uh, they did not believe that God would judge sin. There's no such thing uh, as hell. In fact, the most uh, famous, well-known preacher of that day, um, uh, Henry Ward Beecher, see, came to a point in his life where he said there's no original sin. And uh, then uh, he also said there's no such thing as hell. Now, the only problem is... Um, he also, the most well-known preacher in the mid-1800s, uh, uh, Beecher, Lloyd Beecher, was a pervert himself. He was a sex pervert. And he was the most well-known preacher of that day. He had the biggest crowds of that day. And then he came to deny original sin and deny the doctrine of, uh, of hell. Now, See, it's amazing when we think of what is going on in our society today. And uh, there's always been this push away from the Word of God and what the Bible has to say. And most of the time it originates in Bible-believing churches because people really don't study the Bible. 
But now what we're looking at is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. See, and await for His Son from heaven. See, we are waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back again. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're not looking for signs of the times, anything along that line. We're looking for His Son from heaven. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10. The Bible says, whom He raised from the dead. So if you believe in the resurrection, you believe He's coming back again. No question about that. But it says, even Jesus, see, which delivered us from the wrath to come. See, now, again, see what the Bible says. We have been delivered if we are saved, the Bible says, from the wrath to come. And that's the judgment of God upon uh, sin. See, the wrath of God. We've been delivered. We've been set free from the wrath of God if we are uh, uh, saved. Now, see, um, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. See, the great love of God is revealed in the fact that Jesus Christ was sent into the world by the Father to go to the cross and die for our uh, sins. Now, as uh, 1 John 4, 10, here in His love, say, not that we love God. Say, we, don't, uh, we didn't love the Lord. He loved us first. But He loved us, say, and He sent. Say, and this is redeeming love. This is salvation repeated throughout the Word of God. God's love is revealed in God the Father sending God the Son into the world so that we might have salvation. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now what does that mean? He gave Him on the cross of Calvary. For God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's love. God's love in the Bible is a redeeming love. It's a, it's a saving love. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. That great song, there is a fountain filled uh, uh, with blood. But now in 1 John 4, 10, He loved us, He sent His Son to be the propitiation. But you see, the Bible is a personal book. And John says, for our sins. He doesn't say for your sins. Our sins. See, salvation is personal. It's not impersonal. See, it's a personal thing. We can know that He came to die for my sins, and He was a propitiation for um, my sins. Now, the Bible is uh, very, very clear along this line that there's only one time when God punished sin or when the wrath of God was poured out upon sin. There's one time when uh, God was satisfied, you see, in relation to the sin question. Now, I'm talking about God, looking at it from God's standpoint. Uh, standpoint, there's only one time when God was appeased. See, there's only one time when God was satisfied when it came to the matter of sin. And that is when Jesus Christ, of course, shed His blood on the cross of Calvary. Now, see, when Jesus Christ said in John 19 and verse 30, it is finished. See, the great work of salvation, Jesus Christ, somehow the sin of the world was poured out upon Jesus Christ, and uh, we can have salvation as a result of that. That's why the Bible says, you see in Hebrews 9, uh, 14, that, that Jesus offered Himself up to God. Someone might say, well, I thought He offered Himself up for our sins. Well, Hebrews 9, 14, thinking about propitiation, see, He offered Himself up to God. Why? God was offended. Sin is abhorrent in the sight of God. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He offered Himself up as a sacrifice to God to satisfy God's holiness and righteousness in relation to the matter of sin. Now, that's why you have verses like this in the Bible 
And sometimes people wonder about them and they ask questions about them. Like uh, in Isaiah 53 and verse 10, the Bible says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. And some of them might say, well, how, how, how could God be satisfied in Jesus Christ's uh, sacrifice and the way he was treated in relation to the crucifixion? Yet the Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, see, that's propitiation. See, he satisfied God's holiness. And that is why, see, God was pleased when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Great uh, teaching uh, in the Bible. See, salvation from the standpoint of uh, God Almighty. Now, the motive behind this, of course, is love. And uh, the Bible is very clear that uh, that's the way God demonstrated His love for you and me. That's how we know that God loves you and He loves me because, see, Jesus Christ, He sent Christ into the world to die for our sins. Romans 5, 8. We quoted a million times. Everybody knows Romans 5, 8. God commendeth His love towards us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, we all quote that verse, but see, that's God's love. And how was God's love manifested? You see, uh, when Jesus Christ died for sinners on the cross of Calvary. Now, as we uh, study about that in the Word of God, again, I believe this is one of the most informative of all the Bible doctrines in the Bible because it hel helps us to understand what Bible salvation is all about. See, and that is that God the Father sent His Son into the world so that uh, He might pour out His wrath upon Jesus Christ. And in so doing, you see, He was satisfied in relation to uh, sin being judged and the wrath of God being poured out upon sin. See, Jesus endured the wrath of God. Now, no one can fully understand this. This is a Bible doctrine that is, I believe, the most informative Bible, one of the most informative Bible doctrines in the Bible, but nobody can understand that. How can the Bible say in 1 John 2, 2, He was a propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. How could all of the sins of the world, past, present, and future, be poured out upon Jesus Christ? That's something we cannot fathom. That's something we cannot understand. But that is what Calvary is all about. That's what Christmas is all about. That's why Jesus Christ came uh, in uh, to the world. Say, uh, so to die, and we've all heard it, we sing about it, he say to die for the sin of the world. Now, in what sense? See, he took God's judgment and God's wrath and God's hell for the entire human race when he died on the cross of uh, Calvary. Now, we mentioned this morning, and it's worth um, reiterating, and that is, you see, Jesus Christ was the ontological Son of the Father. Now, this gets us into some real deep theology. Now, and Bible teaching. See, He's the ontological Son of the Father. Now, you say, what does that mean? See, that simply means, say, someone of the exact same essence. See, in other words, Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, and He was of the same essence as God. In other words, He was God. That's why He is referred to in the Bible as God. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and Jesus was God. See, because He was of the same nature and the same essence as the Father. He is no less than the Father. See, He is God of very God. Now, and in that sense, He's the Son of God. See, He's the unique Son of God, and He's the eternal, everlasting, from eternity, Son of God, according 
to the Bible. Now, now see, no one else will ever become the Son of God as Jesus Christ is God's Son. Now, uh, the way we become a child of God and a son of God is by being born again. See, that's how we become a child of God. Or the Bible talks that we become a member of God's family by being adopted into the family of God. But no one, no child of God can ever say that I am the ontological son of God where I am of the very same essence as God. See, no one can ever say that. See, uh, only Jesus Christ. See, he's the only begotten Son of God. What does that mean? He's the one-of-a-kind Son of God. Now, he was God. That's why in our hymn book, over and over again, we have songs, how the mighty God died for our sin. And that is scriptural. And that is biblical. Because, see, God, in the person of Jesus Christ, died for our sins on the cross of uh, uh, Calvary. Now, uh, as we turn to it this morning, uh, we want to emphasize, re-emphasize it tonight. Now, you see, in the Garden of Gethsemane, nobody can ever fathom what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, that's where, according to the Word of God, Jesus was in agony. That is where, according to the Bible, Jesus Christ almost died. That's what the Bible teaches. He was in agony and so forth uh, there uh, in the garden. Now, um, as you turn to Matthew chapter 26 and uh, in verse 38, see, the Bible says, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, uh, tarry ye here and watch uh, with me and pray. Now, he says, see, his soul, the Bible says here, is exceedingly sorrowful. Now, that statement in the Word of God. See, he was exceedingly sorrowful. Now, and then uh, you read on uh, here, in, uh, and he prayed uh, that if the cup could be removed, that the cup uh, would be removed. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will uh, uh, be done. And then, uh, so we see that very uh, clearly uh, here. By the way, Jesus said in verse 41, there in Matthew 26, watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation. If, you don't, if you're not alert, if you're not praying, you will succumb to temptation. Great verse about temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you remember, rather than praying, and this was the most crucial time in their life when they should have prayed and should have been in prayer uh, along with the Lord Jesus when he needed them, uh, the prayer support of these people, they were falling asleep. They, they slept. They didn't pray uh, at all. And then as you turn over to uh, Luke chapter uh, 22. Now, um, in Luke chapter 22, and we we'll read here in verse 39. Now, See, so want to uh, bring out the truth about this. Why? Again, this is uh, one of the most informative and helpful Bible doctrines in all the Word of God. Now, in Luke chapter 22, and we read here in uh, verse 39. See, he went into the Mount of Olives, and that's where he prayed. That was the place that he would go and pray. Uh, Judas knew he was there. And see, this was where the soldiers came with Judas to arrest the Lord as soon as he uh, departed from there. But then uh, um, the, the Bible goes on and in, in verse 42 saying, uh, this is Luke twenty two forty two, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will uh, be done. And then the Bible uh, says in the next verse, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, uh, strengthening him. Now, according to the Bible, he was on the verge of death. He was nigh to death in the garden. Now, in verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed the more uh, earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down uh, to uh, the ground. Now, that's Gethsemane, and nobody can ever fathom uh, Gethsemane. Now, 
Why was Jesus near death to where the Bible says an angel, singular, came and ministered unto him? Now, in all probability, that angel, the Bible says, came and ministered uh, unto him, appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening him. See, in verse 44, and he was in agony. Now, see, and that angel ministered to Jesus and in a way of somehow he strengthened him. Uh, Jesus Christ is on the verge of death. Now, a lot of times we wonder about Gethsemane. Now, here's the thing about Gethsemane. See, why did Jesus Christ, according to the Word of God, almost die in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because that's what the Bible says. He was in agony. Well, another passage says he, he fell down on his face. He prayed earnestly. Luke says it was as great drops of blood falling down. Because you see, Jesus Christ is going to experience something he never experienced before. Say, two things Jesus Christ is going to experience that God the Son, the eternal Son of God, never experienced before. Now, number one is that he was never, ever separated from God the Father. Never, never. He's ne there's never a time when the Son was separated from the Father. But now, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ knows that He's going to be separated from the Father. Now, those famous words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me. See, he's going to be forsaken by God the Father on the cross. Why? See, God cannot look upon sin. And so as a result of that, Jesus Christ will be separated from the Father. Now, another thing about uh, Gethsemane, as you relate it to Calvary, is that Jesus Christ never knew what it was to sin. He never committed a sin. The eternal Son of God upon earth and previously to coming to this earth, He never once sinned. He did not know what sin was. Did you ever think about that? But now on the cross, the Bible says He is going to become sin for you and me. See, He never experienced sin. But the Bible says somehow, and that's why we can preach it, and uh, uh, so forth, but we can never fully understand it. The Bible says he became sin for us. Now, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he was made sin for us. There is um, one of the most effective preachers I ever knew in my life. Uh, a good friend of mine, and I think he was probably the most effective preacher I ever heard uh, preach. And I remember he had a, a sermon that he preached wherever he went. And the sermon was that, uh, that he preached was that Jesus Christ became an adulterer. Jesus Christ became a homosexual. Jesus Christ became uh, a, a, a thief. Now, he based that, let's turn over there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and uh, verse 21. See, and the Bible says, for he hath made him to be sin. Now, that's something I cannot explain, you cannot explain. But I remember that, that preacher used to uh, preach on that. They say he became every sin in the book uh, that anybody could think of from uh, the creation to the end of the world. See, Jesus became, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he hath made him to be sin. But you see, praise God for us. See, he became sin on the cross of Calvary for us. See, and the Bible goes on very clear. He knew no sin. He did not know what sin was, but somehow he became sin. Imagine that. See, he became sin on the cross. Now, that is something that Jesus Christ never experienced. Now, he's going to be separated from the Father. He is going to become sin on the cross, and that, there are two things that he never, ever experienced in all 
of his existence. And that is why he almost died in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not only that, but in Luke chapter 23 and in verses 44 and uh, uh, 45, it talks here about what happened on Calvary. And it's something we need to zero in on. And uh, in Luke 23 uh, and verse 44, and it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now, that's 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Now, I'm talking about preachers, I know. Another outstanding Bible preacher, tremendous evangelist. I think uh, uh, one of the greatest evangelists, and by the way, we have a lot of his books out there in the book rack, Oliver Green. You want to get some good sermon books, get those books by Oliver Green. They're out there in uh, uh, the book rack. But uh, now, when he preached on this, now Oliver Green actually believed that there was darkness over all the world, not only on Cal at Calvary, not only in Jerusalem, but he preached it, and he said he believed that it was throughout the whole world for these three uh, hours. Because, see, it was during those three hours that Jesus Christ endured the wrath of God. He, did, he endured hell on that hill of Calvary. All hell was poured out upon Jesus Christ for everybody who has ever lived or ever will live. Now, explain that. Nobody can explain that. That's uh, what we refer to as the atonement. See, but the word atonement is never used in the New Testament because that means to cover. But we use that word because it uh, helps us understand something about Calvary. Uh, but now, uh, you see, he believes that it was throughout the whole world. Now, I don't know. But you see what the Bible says here? There is darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now, the perp and the Bible says in the next verse, and the sun was darkened, and then the veil of the temple was rent uh, in tr uh, two. And then Jesus cried out, and the Bible says there with a loud voice. Now, see, all of this is very, very instructive. Now, in other words, see, no one was allowed to see Jesus Christ enduring the wrath of God. Nobody ever saw that because there was darkness. Say, so nobody could see it. Now, why did that happen on Calvary? You see, when Jesus Christ is dying for the sin of the world, because, say, God would not allow anybody to look upon His Son while He became sin and while the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ. See, uh, all hell was poured out for all time upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was darkness over all the face of the earth. Now, that is why, see, in all sound doctrinal statements, what churches believe See, they, uh, if they believe the Bible, they believe in what is referred to as a substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Now, what do we mean by that? See, Christ died as my substitute. Christ took my hell upon him on the cross of Calvary. Now, and then uh, doctrinal statements, sometimes you use the word vicarious. Now, the word, word vicarious means that, see, he uh, died in my place. He died for me on the cross. In what sense? See, he took the judgment of God that I deserve upon my sin, upon himself, on the cross of Calvary. The substitutionary, the vicarious death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somehow, you see, the wrath of God was poured out. The total, full, eternal, everlasting uh, wrath of God, you see, was poured out upon Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Now, that's why there is darkness over the land. God would not allow anybody to see Jesus Christ suffering the wrath of God for the sins of the world. Now, it's very interesting what Luke says, see, and uh, he goes on, and uh, verse 46, and when Jesus had cried, see, with a loud voice, that's very interesting. 
Say, a loud voice. Now, what does that mean? He had all of his faculties about him. He knew exactly what was going on. It's not that he fainted, swoon, uh, swooned out, you know, and somehow, but say, with a loud voice, say, he was in command of his uh, life at that particular time. Say, uh, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he underwent when he was undergoing the wrath of God. And then uh, you see what it says there. And he says, Father, into thy hands, say, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. But he cried with a loud voice. See, Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. Jesus said, I laid down my life. He laid down his life voluntarily. He did not die until he had finished suffering God's wrath upon sin for the entire world. So um, it's amazing as we study the Word of God. You see, and that's something we can never fully get a hold of. But you see, on the cross, Jesus Christ somehow endured hell for everybody. See, the, the hell that everybody uh, uh, deserves. See, he died on the cross of Calvary. Now, that is why, as we mentioned, in the epistles, Romans through Revelation, there is no mention of Bethlehem, there is no mention of Mary, and there's no mention of Joseph. You don't find it in the epistles. Now, but over and over again, in Romans through Revelation, what do we read about? We read about the death of Jesus Christ. We read about the blood of Jesus Christ 160 times or more uh, in the epistles. Uh, we read about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, and uh, uh, who loved us and gave himself, you see, uh, for us and washed our sins in his own blood. You see, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 7, cleanses us from all uh, sin. See, the emphasis is on the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price for my sin on the cross of Calvary. You see, and he endured the wrath of God. That, that is what the Bible doctrine of propitiation is all about. There's only one time and one place that God was satisfied in relation to the sin question. Only one time and one place, you might say, see, where God, this is the doctrine of propitiation, satisfied himself. He satisfied himself. You see, in Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary. That is how God was pleased and satisfied himself in relation to the sin question. That's why you and I can go free. See, that's why you and I can be forgiven. That's why you and I can go to heaven someday, because Jesus took my wrath. He took the punishment that I deserve. I deserve to go to hell. But that penalty that I deserve was paid by Jesus Christ, paid in full. That's why when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. Amen? See, the work of salvation was finished once and for all and forever. Now, that is why when we uh, study the Word of God and the sermons in the Word of God and the preaching in the Word of God is what? See, the cross. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Our sins can be forgiven because what He did for us on the cross of Calvary. And that is the only way to be forgiven. There's nothing you can do and I can do to satisfy God in relation to sin. We mentioned the illustration this morning of a man who committed a terrible crime. He was uh, paroled and he said, I want to spend the rest of my life. Leopold, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the man there that committed that crime. And he said, I want to spend the rest of my life uh, working in a leper colony. And he said, the reason why I want to work in that leper colony is he said, I want it to 
atone for my sin. He said, I know I did wrong when I murdered, along with my buddy, 15-year-old Bobby uh, Franks was the boy's name, who uh, was uh, uh, killed there, was murdered by them. Uh, And you see, he was paroled after 33 years in prison. And now he says, I want to spend the rest of my life atoning for my sin. Now, you see, his intentions were good, but he could never atone for his sin. The Bible never says that by your works of even good righteousness that you can atone for your sin or have your sins forgiven. See, why? Because, see, there's only one place and one time where God dealt with the sin question and was satisfied in the sin question, where his wrath upon sin was satisfied, and that is on the cross of Calvary. So, you see, now, the devil's religion, according to the Bible, is work salvation, that I can be forgiven by my good works. See, that's work salvation. See, the Bible doesn't uh, teach do, but it teaches done. The work was done uh, by Jesus Christ. But that's what the devil tells people. And people think that if they're good, or they give money, or again, if they work in a leper colony, or if they try to do something to help somebody else, their sins will be forgiven. See, that is work salvation. That leaves Jesus Christ out. There's only one time and one place where God dealt with sin, and that was on the cross of Calvary. And that's why the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. There's only one way. That's why Jesus Christ said, that familiar verse in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way. Amen? He didn't say, I am a way. He's the only way because he took the judgment uh, uh, that I deserve somehow on that cross of Calvary. And you say, well, pastor, how could he do it? Now, we cannot understand it. We don't know how he could die for the sins of everybody that's ever born in the past, present, and anybody that ever lived uh, in the future. But now, the closest we can come to it is he could do it because of who he was. See, only Jesus could pay for our sin. He was God in human flesh. He was God incarnate. Remember what the angel told Joseph? He shall save his people from their sins. That's why he came, to save from sin. But you see, the reason why he could do it is because he was the divine Son of God. He was God. And we can say, according to the Word of God, God died for my sin. And that is why I can be forgiven. Say, why could he take the hell of the world upon himself and make atonement for our sin because of who he was? John begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John says there was nothing made, not anything that was ever made that was not made by Jesus Christ. No such thing as evolution, according to the Bible. And then you remember what John says uh, in his Christmas story in John chapter 1. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him. But as many as received uh, him, to them gave he power, the authority to become the sons of God. Say, Jesus Christ could die for my sin, and your sin, and the sin of the world, because of who he was. He was God who died for our uh, sins. That's why Luke ends the book, his gospel in Luke 24 and verse 47. You say that repentance and remission of sins, Luke says, the last thing in the book of Luke, 
that re, uh, repentance and remission of sins be preached in His name. You see the key there? In His name, in the name of Jesus Christ, in relation to what Jesus Christ did uh, on the cross. See, and uh, early in the chapter, Jesus said, didn't you know that even the Old Testament taught how the, uh, the Savior would come and He would suffer and He'd rise again uh, the third day? So the Bible is very, very clear. Say, uh, we need to repent and we can be forgiven of our sin in the name of Jesus Christ because, Luke tells us earlier in the book, because he died for our sin. Now, here's another interesting thing about this whole subject. And that is when uh, we read the Gospel of John. Now, the Gospel of John is probably the, uh, the most favored of all the Gospels. The most quoted of all the Gospels. But here's an interesting thing about the Gospel of John. Half of that Gospel has to do with Jesus going to the cross and the cross and the resurrection. Now, most of the time when you read a book about somebody, even some famous American or uh, some uh, great historical per, uh, person, it tells you all about what he did in his life and the accomplishments of his life. And most all the books you ever read about somebody it's very interesting. And then at the end of the, the book, the last paragraph, it says, and he died. You know, he, he had a heart attack or he died of old age or whatever, and he died. But see, most of the book doesn't take half the book to talk about his death. You see, that's not the way books are written. Now, see the point? See, the Gospel of John, half of that book from the midpoint on has to do with the cross has to do with Jesus going to the cross, has to do with uh, the fact that he is preparing his disciples for what will happen after he dies. So, say, what's the whole emphasis there? Say, it's a death. Say, John's emphasis is on the death of Jesus Christ, how he is going to die for our sins. What, what does John say? Say, that's the important thing about Jesus Christ. That's why in the epistles, over and over again, we read about his death, we read about his blood, we read about his cross. Why? Because that is where he made salvation possible was on that cross of Calvary. And what a blessing that is to know that. And I'm sure most everybody here tonight uh, knows that. You see, that I can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. My only hope of heaven, my only plea of heaven is Jesus Christ. And you see how everything goes back to the cross. Everything goes back to Calvary. That's why I believe there's a lot of cheap gospel preaching today. It's cheap. It's um, meaningless. It's easy believism, and then never get around to what Calvary is all about. That's why I encourage you to get some of those books back there in a book rack. I mean, uh, the fellow that wrote those books, he had a tremendous emphasis on Calvary and uh, the cross and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Well, that's the great teaching in the Bible about propitiation. See, the Christmas verse, and I've seen this on some Christmas cards, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Say, and uh, the Father sent the Son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins. How we thank God for that, amen? Say, that's why Jesus came, to die for our sins. See, and He satisfied all the righteousness of God. He satisfied all the holiness of God through what he endured on the cross of Calvary. Well, I trust that God will speak to our hearts. I pray that God would uh, help us.